Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Fernley. I'm a historian of the 20th century United States at the University of Manchester's Programme in American Studies. Welcome. I was recently asked by a local sixth form to give a talk to A-level students on the role of the American president in advancing the position of African Americans from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. At a time when international news is saturated with discussions of the place of the American president, and also in a year when millions have mobilized in the United States and indeed globally to demonstrate that Black Lives Matter and against the historic and contemporary resonances of racism and injustice, this seemed like a really crucial topic to think about and also one that might have a wider reach. Given the conditions of the pandemic, I've obviously not been able to give that talk in person and so I've recorded it instead and we're making it widely available through this channel. Now the sixth form that invited me to look at this question with them also asked that I make clear how a professional historian might approach it and also what professional historians have had to say about the topic so far. So those are going to be my bearings throughout. The talk's going to last about 30 minutes and it's organised so that we take the several assumptions that have been baked into the question in turn. The lecture is accompanied by a handout so if you're studying this question formally for A-level and you haven't already taken a look at it I'd suggest that you might want to pause the video now, download a copy, and then return once you've spent a moment looking at where we're going to go. There were 21 US presidents in the period from 1861 to 1965, the majority of whom did little to advance, much to impede, the position of African Americans. You can see all of them here. In fact, and in summary, there are only four, possibly five, presidents who, in my view, warrant serious examination under these terms. Most, in fact, who occupied the White House during this period would seem to fit the description that journalist Nick Bryant made about John F. Kennedy. That is, they were bystanders, or, for example, in the case of Woodrow Wilson, far worse. By reaching this judgment at the outset, and I'll spend the remainder of my talk explaining how we get here, I want to clear the way to recognise that the presidency was not only not an important factor in advancing the position of African Americans in a sustained way during this period, but it was often hardly a factor at all. I think most professional historians of the US would not accept the premise of the question, presidents having long been downgraded in American historical writing, even as US political history has once more become a resurgent field. Since the mid-1980s, and with gathering pace in recent years, scholars of the black freedom struggle in particular have also shifted their attention away from high politics to the local level, showing the importance of organising amongst ordinary people and recovering the study of those marginalised by earlier histories, not least women, and it's worth recognising at the outset that this is a question that implicitly associates power and political change with men. One might mention here, by way of illustrating the trend I've just described, Charles Payne's massive 500-page study of the Mississippi Freedom Struggle, which was published in 1995, and which pointedly contains no index entries for White House or President, and really only a few passing and brief mentions of particular uh, presidential administrations. To examine the influence of presidents in this realm, I think it's helpful to outline precisely what type of powers the executive branch possesses. It's crucial to remember that a president, much to the frustration of the current incumbent and to the relief of everyone else, has fairly limited powers. As President Lyndon Johnson once remarked, and I'll attempt my best Texan hill country drawl here, the only power I got is nuclear, and I can't even use that. <clears throat> Johnson was overstating, of course, though he also likely had in mind Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black's famous remark that the US Constitution does not confer lawmaking powers on the president. Remember, the United States was deliberately engineered in this way so that it did not become a presidential government. And that's certainly true through at least the early 1930s. This chart 
from political scientist Charles Jones' very short introduction to the American presidency is really helpful in laying out the powers that presidents do possess. I'll refer to these powers throughout my talk and I'll show how interventions by particular presidents often drew directly, sometimes surprisingly, on these specific powers. In the domestic realm, we can see that a president can recommend laws that he thinks are good, and he can veto those which he thinks are bad. He can do this, of course, in a number of ways. Through speeches, like his State of the Union address, also through skillfully working the congressional committees. He can, of course, make appointments or nominations, and if you're unsure what this authority means, you might want to take a look at the recent headlines. Crucially, though, presidents also enjoy other, less well-defined powers. The political scientist Bruce Miroff has written, for example, about a president's leading place in the country's political theatre. Another strain of presidential power that crystallised during the period of this question was the ability to issue executive orders. These are basically announcements about how the government should run. They set out administrative rules. Executive orders would become a staple of, of, of the executive during this period, and significantly, as the political scientist Ruth P. Morgan has shown, they tended to be used to enable action in the realm of civil rights. So it's a reminder then that anyone setting about answering this question needs to think carefully not only about the growth in and changes to civil rights, but also the changing nature of the federal government itself. To examine the role of presidents in advancing the position of African Americans, it's useful to look at some particular examples. And here I've selected three such moments to do this, from the 1860s, from the late 1930s and from the 1950s, moments when I think it's uncontrovertible that advancement was made by people of colour. There can be little doubt that Lincoln's proclamation of emancipation in January 1863 constitutes one major advancement. It set free four million slaves who'd been held in bondage in Confederate-controlled states. This act remakes the terms of the Civil War and ever thereafter the contours of American racial democracy. The historian Eric Foner writes that it was the largest act of slave emancipation in world history. It's a hugely daring and dramatic intervention, and one really without precedent in American politics and society up to this point. It's crucial to remember, though, as Fona certainly does, that it did not free slaves in the border states, or in parts of, for instance, Virginia and Tennessee, which had already been retaken by Union troops. Fona estimates that this was probably around 800,000 people who were not set free by the proclamation. So while the question in front of us seems to imply that presidential actions have a uniform and singular effect on people of colour, Lincoln's proclamation actually provides good evidence that these actions could affect some African Americans more than others, and this seems like a valuable point to put into play and to keep running along. Now Lincoln knew that his proclamation was risky, it stretched his powers to their legal limits as a lawyer he knew this, and as such, he was very careful to rest it on the presidential power of being commander-in-chief. That's why he wrote that it was warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity. The freeing of all African-American slaves would not, would not happen, of course, for another two years, until 1865, with the passage by the US Congress and its ratification of the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment was more wide-reaching in its effects than Lincoln's proclamation. It eradicated the institution of slavery from the United States rather than just freeing particular slaves. Yet, it was the proclamation that nevertheless got remembered and celebrated in African-American culture. It would be the proclamation, for instance, that would become synonymous with the idea of freedom itself. Its, its anniversary would be kept, as we can see here, by black Americans for many decades thereafter, as this image also shows. Sometimes then, it was the case that while the role of the president was not actually the most important factor in advancing the position of African Americans, 
it was nevertheless presidential action that became emblematic of that advancement. Now, passage of the 13th Amendment happened, of course, as part of the massive legislative and political process that we call Reconstruction, which remakes the US nation. Foner calls it the Second Founding. And Reconstruction was largely originated in and shaped by the American Congress. It encompasses a raft of measures that I don't have time to describe, but which includes uh, what was known as the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a hugely ambitious project in the provisions it made for former slaves, as well as three constitutional amendments, which grant citizenship to African Americans and gave black men the vote in 1870. It's important to remember that Reconstruction was not only enacted by Congress, but much of this legislation and policy also served to empower Congress as well. So, if you read the three constitutional amendments that get passed between 1865 and 1870, here you can see the language of the 15th Amendment, you'll see that each of them contains a short clause asserting that Congress, in the case of the 15th Amendment, has the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Whatever else one thinks about the period known as Reconstruction, and opinions have admittedly diverged and never been settled, one has to recognise, I think, the paramount role that Congress played, not the President, in shaping the project and the process. One would, I think, have to look with some suspicion at the suggestion that the President was the, or indeed even a, major factor in black advancement in the decades from the mid-1860s on. Now, it's commonly said by American historians that the biggest achievement on race relations since Reconstruction was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's creation of the Fair Employment Practices Commission, incredibly 70 or so years later, in June 1941. The FEPC, as it became known, was created amid America's wartime mobilizations, and it set out that there shall be no discrimination in the employment of workers in defence industries and in government because of race, creed, colour or national origin. The FEPC was created through an executive order. It's a tool that the political scientist Ruth Morgan has argued frequently served as the vanguard of new laws around civil rights, and it's one that would be used more frequently by presidents from the 1930s on. You can see here some of the other examples of executive orders um, that happen around civil rights, including Harry Truman's desegregation of the US military in 1948, which, like Lincoln's earlier proclamation, happened under his powers of being commander-in-chief. Even though Morgan concedes that the policies established by executive orders did not radically change the lives of African Americans, and the FEPC had no real powers to prosecute contractors who it found guilty of discrimination, it nevertheless was a symbolically significant act. It was a clear signal of presidential intervention, and it also offered African Americans and their allies a means of exposing flagrant cases of workplace discrimination, and they did this uh, in great number through around 12,000 wartime investigations. If Roosevelt signed the FEPC into existence in June 1941, scholars generally agree that he did so using the ink and the ideas of Asa Philip Randolph and his March on Washington movement. Perhaps little remembered today, it's hard to overestimate the importance of Randolph or his March on Washington movement in these years. His efforts mobilised millions of working class uh, African Americans across industrial cities, what Roosevelt called America's arsenals of democracy, and it marked one expression of a much broader swell that historian Robert Corstad has called civil rights unionism, and that you can see examples of here. In the decade after 1935, there's little doubt that this broad and increasingly militant coalition would, was the backbone of black advancement. The historian Julian Zalitzer writes that this coalition was instrumental in directing the drive for civil rights from inside the nation's capital before there was strong presidential support of a mass movement. 
The coalition was especially effective in making advances for African Americans in their workplace, in electing black officials, including even to Congress, in the tenfold growth that civil rights groups saw in terms of their own membership, and in the growing pressure that it placed on public institutions such as the US military, Major League Baseball, and the court system. It's to the court system that we're going to next turn, and in particular to the passage of the Brown v. Board of Education decision in May 1954. The Brown decision overturned one of the main legal principles of the Jim Crow order, namely the doctrine of separate but equal, and it stands as a significant source of black advancement in the middle years of the 20th century. It's worth noting here that although attempts have been made by at least one scholar to present the Brown decision as the institutional mission of the earlier Roosevelt administration in the 30s and 40s through the appointment of several key justices to the bench, this strikes me as a fanciful claim. The Brown decision, much like the creation of the FEPC, was rather the result of the broad mobilisations of the wartime years, and in particular of the concerted legal strategy of the NAACP and of the scores of black plaintiffs across the United States who begin to file and petition courts for decisions around examples of discrimination. While some, such as historian Adam Fairclough, remind us that not everyone benefited from Brown, for instance many black teachers lost their jobs as schools closed and integrated, there can be little doubt that Brown was a major symbolic victory for African Americans. It marks what historian James Patterson memorably called a civil rights milestone. If the decision was authored by the Supreme Court, the enforcement of the Brown decision in the ensuing years was reliant on presidential action, particularly that of Eisenhower and Kennedy. And the record of both of these administrations, Republican and Democrat, of putting the law into practice during the 50s and early 60s was less than impressive. In both cases, African-American activists and their allies, in the form of high school students in Little Rock, Arkansas, or young people who rode Greyhound buses all across the South, found themselves often isolated and taking the lead to prod for federal and presidential action. Eisenhower was notoriously ineffective in this realm, expressing little public support for the Brown decision, even during the 1956 presidential election campaign. I think it makes no difference whether or not I endorse it, he told reporters on one occasion. Eisenhower's blithe in action, his equivocation over Brown, created a space in which white supremacy, in the form of massive resistance, took seed and was permitted to grow across the US South. It reminds us then that presidential inaction was also sometimes an important factor, not in advancing the position of African Americans, but rather in advancing the forces that were opposed to them. This was, as historian William Chafe observed many years ago, as true of Eisenhower in the aftermath of the Brown decision as it had been of Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, in the middle decades, sorry, in the middle years of the 1860s. Now, one issue that's run through this talk so far, and which I really want to try to foreground in this final section, concerns how much African Americans recognise the president as a factor in their own political and social advancement. To do this, I want to turn to the so-called classical phase of the civil rights movement, what historians sometimes call the Montgomery to Memphis period, though of course we won't get to Memphis. What I want to emphasise here in brief is the importance of the interplay that existed during these years between presidents, particularly Kennedy and Johnson, and what was called the civil rights movement. Historians have long called attention to this feature and recently have emphasised that if this was an exchange, it was one that was initiated largely by African-American activists and their allies. So, for example, historian David C. Carter has recently written, for instance, about how assistance and intervention from above in the form of court decisions and executive action only 
emerged after sustained pressure from below by those at the grassroots level. This is a good example of what happens in 1961, both around the sit-ins and around the Freedom Rides. It's also crucial to recognise here that black activists, in a variety of ways, also began to strategically pressure presidents through print, photograph and television. Between roughly 1957 and 1963, for instance, Martin Luther King Jr. authored a sustained public campaign to encourage presidential action. He does this through writing popular magazine articles, penning open letters, and even, as you can see here, a 75-page appeal to President Kennedy. In all of these documents and public statements, King was unequivocal, as he wrote in 1961, that the president could give segregation its death blow through the stroke of a pen. Now, we have to recognise here in handling these sources that these statements are not straightforward reflections of King's belief about how political change worked or was going to work. Rather, they're expressions of his own politics, their strategic attempts to needle a notoriously reluctant presidential administration, in the case of Kennedy, into action by trying to create a context of and an urgency for that presidential action. So, if presidents were an important factor in black advancement during the 15 or so years after the Brown decision, we need to point out here that they were so largely because the movement positioned them as such. Now, King, of course, got the presidential action he needed almost immediately, in fact, when Johnson assumed the office in late 1963. As one of Johnson's advisers later told it, at 4am, just hours after being sworn in as the new president, Johnson lay awake in bed, thankfully we don't have a photograph of this, and surrounded by his closest advisers, he mapped out a grand vision for his team, including tax cuts, tackling poverty, as well as a civil rights bill and voting rights legislation. Johnson's conviction to act in this realm, I think, was much greater than any other post-war president, but it's equally notable that his skill and ability to do so was also markedly greater than any of his predecessors. He was a master of the Senate, as his biographer Robert Caro has described him, unrivaled in these years in getting difficult legislation through Congress and ensuring the votes to get it passed into law. This, of course, was the case with both the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which had languished under Kennedy in, uh, the, in Congress, and the Voting Rights Act a year later in 1965. Johnson was masterful at setting the legislative agenda then. His first State of the Union address in 1964 insisted that the session do more for civil rights than the last hundred sessions combined. And throughout that speech, if you read it, you'll see him instructing lawmakers to abolish not some, but all racial discrimination. Now, Johnson was equally skillful in his handling of the group known as the Big Six, the leaders of the main civil rights organisations. And he did this, for instance, by establishing close personal relationships with a number of them, especially the NAACP's Roy Wilkins and the Urban League's Whitney Young. Yet among grassroots organisers, such as Gloria Richardson Dandridge, a SNCC activist in Cambridge, Maryland, presidents in this period, even somebody like Johnson, mattered much less to them than uh, to national figures like Wilkins and Young. National civil rights leaders would go to the White House and would be asked if they could calm us down, Dandridge told one oral historian. But, she went on, it's our bodies out in the streets. It's our movement. As historian Stephen Lawson judges, events during 1964 and 65 show the inability of a president, even as shrewd as Johnson, to manage totally the cause of black militancy. The sentiment that Dandridge expressed in that quotation was widely encountered across the Deep South and, after 1965, also found across the urban north too. 
In states like Georgia and Mississippi, for example, people did not necessarily see the president as a key figure in bringing about their transformation, and instead activists and ordinary people developed what they called a community organising tradition, valorising the development of leadership and self-reliance amongst ordinary people. As Ella Baker, a tireless activist of those campaigns, remarked, People have to be made to understand that they cannot look for salvation anywhere but to themselves. In the last few years, scholars have similarly emphasised this stance among other groups of activists. Christopher Schmidt's excellent recent book on the sit-ins, for instance, makes a convincing case that it was young black students, mostly in states like North Carolina, and not those in great positions of power, like senior judges or lawyers, who helped to reshape definitions of the 14th Amendment, and who thus created the legal pressure for the passage of the Civil Rights Act. By the time of the urban rebellions in 1967-68, these ideas would be widely held among working-class blacks. When one presidential advisor visited Chicago, Harlem and Oakland, he reported back to the White House, that it was almost like visiting a foreign country. Urban African Americans tend to look on the president and our government as foreign. So what I've tried to do in this short, admittedly selective talk is to put forward the view that's contrary to the popular and often cinematic depiction of this issue, that presidents played a remarkably small role in the sustained advancement of African Americans during this period. I've done so because I think the evidence broadly bears out the case, but particularly because I've also tried to prod those of you who are formally studying this topic, for example, for A-level, to really think about the direction of your own interpretations. To some degree, the small role that I've identified for the presidents was the result of the US political system and its many traditions and we've seen how those presidents, such as Lincoln, Roosevelt, Truman, and Johnson, who did act in ambitious ways, often did so on the basis of particular powers. It was also the case, interestingly, that the presidents, such as Johnson and the others that I've just named, who did act most decisively on this issue, were those who, in the wider realm, were also most assertive in expanding or enforcing executive authority. It's definitely the case that presidents and the presidency would become a more important factor in the 20th century than it had been at any point in the 19th. It's important though in making this latter point to realize or to examine why that might be so. And one of the arguments that I tried to make in the final section of the lecture was that we need to understand the role that the civil rights movement and civil rights activists played in strategically prodding various presidents, particularly Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson, into assuming that role. One of the smaller arguments that I've tried to make throughout is the need to unpack what we call advancement. Because as I've tried to show, the effects of presidential actions could often be quite varied on different groups of African Americans, for instance, between slaves in the border states and those in Confederate held territory in 1863, 64 or 65. And similarly, that we need to be equally attentive to presidential inaction, as I showed with Eisenhower's uh, stance on the Brown decision, which often could equally abet the forces most opposed to African-American advancement. In the final reckoning then, this is a really good question to think with because it invites us to scrutinize the forces that really drove the unmistakable shift in the position and profile of African-Americans in US politics and society. And as always, such historical reflections serve as a good tributary to examine the current state of American racial democracy and the role and the responsibility of the president in our own contemporary moment. <laughs>